everybody. Welcome to Destiny Church Online Alive. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And we just encourage you, invite you to just to uh, gather around and uh, just get your hearts prepared to worship and to receive the word this morning. We believe that God is going to do something great in your life. He'll minister to you. He'll uh, make himself more real to you than ever before. And so just put some effort into listening and to receive this morning. I believe that God will minister to you. You know, there's no distance in the realm of the spirit. You know, even though we're separated by, t by distance here today, um, there's no distance there uh, in, in the spiritual realm. And so just be a partaker, be a receiver of what God has for your life today. But let's begin our service by prayer today. Lord, we just thank you for every single person that is watching this, no matter where they're, where they're watching this service today. We just pray, God, today that you'll minister to them, that you'll bring life into their life. Lord, we just pray that if there's any that are discouraged or fearful or or frustrated, Lord, we just pray, God, that you'd be the, the glory and the lifter of their heads today. And Lord, as we sing and as we worship, we just pray that by your spirit, you would just invade their, their place of uh, gathering right now. We just pray, Lord, that you would speak to their hearts, speak intimately to them. You love them, Lord, so much with an everlasting love. And Lord, I just pray that you reveal yourself to them and make your ways known to them today, Lord. I just pray, God, a blessing upon every single person that's joined us here today. And may your glory fill their rooms where they're at. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Just let, let's jump right in.
good to be in the presence of God. It's just like, it's 
Psalms 91 says, it's like his massive arms. We can just feel like his massive arms wrapped around us, protecting us. And we can run under his covering of majesty and we can hide. You know, and in days of uncertainty, it's so good. It's so good to know that there's one thing that never fails. And it's our faithful God. And he is a matchless God. Psalms 92 talks about there's no one like him. He's our matchless God, the one we can run to and hide in. And, you know, what we're doing here is just spilling out praise out of our hearts to God. And Psalms 92 said it's so enjoyable to come before you, God, with uncontainable praises spilling from our hearts. How we love to sing our praises over and over to you, to the matchless God, high and exalted over all. At each and every sunrise, we will be thanking you for your kindness, for your love. As the sun sets and all through the night, we will keep proclaiming you are so faithful. It's so good to know. It's so good to have something that we can, we can know is the same always. And God is always the same. He's always pouring out his, his love. And he's always ready to wrap his arms around us and protect us and guide us. So today, thank you for joining us in praise and worship. And this worship team has led us in, into the presence of God. And so we're just, we're just glad to be worshiping <clears throat> that matchless God with you today. Um, we're going to continue worshiping here with um, giving an offering, and I'll let Lauren do that. Thanks, Trish. Well, good morning, church. I, by faith, heard those voices singing with us this morning. Um, I just wanted to remind you there's a couple ways that you can give. I know that um, that's something that you guys have been so consistent with, and Jesus sees your generous hearts. And... Um, I just wanted to make sure you knew there's a couple ways to give. One is you can send those checks right to the church and that address, which will be popping up on a screen as you grab a pen right now if you'd like, but it's 27871 140th Avenue, Ashby, Minnesota, 56309. And the other way that you can give is just a text um, an amount to 218-316-6085. Again, thank you for your faithfulness. And we just speak a blessing over you and your home, not just financially, but in anything that your hand touches, that it would be prosperous and excel, and that you'd have peace in every aspect of your life. And so we're just believing in faith for that over yourselves and over your, um, or over you and your homes. So um, that giving screen is going to pop up. And just be blessed today. We're going to get ready and receive the word from Pastor Steve. I have a message here for you that I want to talk about. I have um, been asking the Lord like what he would like me to share with you. And uh, I've titled this message, A Voice Activated Redemption. A Voice Activated Redemption. You know, it's interesting. Most of us have cell phones or some kind of a electronic device that we use um, to communicate with. And I found out some things about my cell phone that I didn't realize uh, before but it's actually kind of listening. There must be some kind of algorithm or something that goes on with your cell phone because it, um, I, I was talking to somebody one day and we were talking about a town somewhere in Canada and uh, the next day, I, as I, I was scrolling through the Yahoo homepage headlines, there were advertisements for, for timeshares or for vacation spots in that town that we had talked about the day before. And I'm going... This is, this is creepy. It's like Big Brother is listening in on you. And, and so it was kind of, a, kind of an eye-opening. But uh, So we are familiar with voice-activated uh, devices that we're all part of. And, um, and so I want to talk to you about a voice-activated redemption and how important our words are, what we say, what, what comes out of our mouth. A lot of times you know, we think words are just kind of frivolous. In fact, when I was growing up, we had a saying that went something like this. I think this is right. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me or something like that. And, uh, but the truth is, 
All of us know that words do hurt us, and words can be very hurtful. But the Bible has a lot to say about what we say and the words that come out of our mouth. In fact, uh, when Paul was going to describe salvation by faith in Romans chapter 10, he said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. He actually said that salvation, the way it starts, is by us making a confession that Jesus Christ is my, my, our Lord. And the next verse says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you think about that. That's how we start out the Christian life. You know, I had this experience when I first became a Christian. I got saved on New Year's Eve night, 1971. If you can imagine that. And I wasn't going to get saved. I was actually going to a party. It's really a long story. It's different than our, than our discussion tonight. But I, I got saved kind of by myself. I prayed by my bed, in my bedroom, alone. And um, I felt like, you know, I felt like I was saved. I, received, I trusted Christ for my salvation. But I was still kind of like wondering in my head. And one night I went to a, a Bible study in a house. And I was asked to testify because they heard that I just received Christ. And so I got up and I testified. And I have to tell you that after I testified publicly that Jesus Christ was my Lord, something happened to me. Something happened. Something shifted on the inside. Well, I had actually obeyed this scripture even though I didn't know it was in the Bible. Confession is made unto salvation. I had made a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ. And so when you start out, our, the words that come out of our mouth are very important, essential for our salvation. You know, Jesus said this about words in, Ma in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. He said, for by your words, you are justified and by your words, you are condemned. Think about that. By your words, you are justified and by your words, you are condemned. And so, in fact, if you think about it, we are standing on a planet looking at a creation, a universe that was created by words. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says, and God said, and God said. And so uh, it's important that we understand how important our words are and how they set the direction of our life. You know, James said that our, our words or our tongue is like the rudder uh, of, a, of a ship. And so when you think about the rudder, the rudder steers the ship. And he says that our tongue is like that. It steers our lives. And so I want to use as our passage this morning, I want to go to a passage in the book of Zechariah. We, we looked at this last week, but I'm going to look at a different uh, verse here. And this is Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 7. And so let me just set the setting here. Uh, you know, this is Zechariah. He's a prophet. And uh, the context is the people have been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And so now they've gotten permission from the the king there to return and they are allowed to rebuild the temple, the city, and basically rebuild their whole society. And so this is a really a big step in them recapturing their culture, recapturing their religion, their animal sacrifices. It's very important. And so they went back and then for 18 years, they've been struggling trying to make some progress on rebuilding especially the temple, and they've made absolutely no progress whatsoever. There's, there's difficulty in getting food. They have people around surrounding uh, the Jerusalem there. They're giving them a hard time. And what it's come down to is they've making no progress, and it doesn't look like any progress is on the horizon. And so God gives Zechariah a word for these people. And part of the word is found in verse 7 of Zechariah 4. It says this, who are you? This is God speaking through the prophet. Who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace unto it. So here's, here's an interesting passage when you think about it. Zerubbabel in this verse is the ruler, the one that's set at rebuilding the temple. And, and, and God is speaking here, and God is speaking to two different entities here. God is speaking first to the, the mountain of difficulty. 
the, the impossibility, the impossible situation. I don't know if you ever face impossible situations, but these people were facing a, a situation they had been in for 18 long years. And I think most of them had given up. And all of a sudden God shows up and speaks to this prophet and says, and, and it's kind of an interesting the way the wording is. Who are you, great mountain before Zerubbabel? You'll become a plain. It's almost like the, he's saying with an attitude, with a defiant attitude. Who do you think you are, uh, uh, oh great mountain? And he says, not only are you going to become a plain, but he, but he says it with an attitude. It's almost like uh, some uh, attitude in there. Uh, and so... It's very important that we understand that God is not intimidated by impossible, um, impossible situations. You might be facing, like I said, an impossible situation right now, and you may have been struggling with it for years, maybe 18 years or maybe 10 years or 20 years, and you may have just given up and just say, well, this is the way it is. Maybe this is the, the Lord's will or whatever. But I want you to know that God has a word for your situation. And God is not in the least bit intimidated. And that's how the prophet words this. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Great prophet, great uh, mountain before Zerubbabel. You know, when we think about that, it's kind of a strange way because we're not used to speaking to things, you know, uh, speaking to difficulty or speaking to hard times or speaking to situations. I mean, we, we speak to people but we don't speak to things, inordinate objects. But this prophet is speaking to a, a mountain of difficulty, a mountain of trouble. He's speaking right to it. And this is he's being inspired by God. And not only does he speak to it, but he tells what's going to happen to you. You great mountain, you're going to become a plane. You're going to flatten out. You know, I think we should speak to this virus and just say, virus, your days are numbered. You're, you're this whole thing is going to flatten out. You're going to dissipate and disappear. We need some people that will speak to it. You know, so when you think about that, that's a, a very powerful uh, thing, but it's, it's kind of a strange thing. It's foreign to us. You know, I, when I read this story about, uh, you know, speaking to this mountain and, and this defiant, the way, the way it's, it's, it's said, it's not just Oh, great mountain before Zerubbabel. It's like, who are you? It's kind of like a defiant with an attitude. It's almost, it's like bold. It's like uh, uh, whatever, you know, you get the idea. And so when I read that, I thought about the story of David in the Bible with Goliath. Because it's almost the same attitude or the same spirit that's expressed. You know, when you read the story, most of us have heard it. Um, Goliath is this gigantic towering figure that's a great warrior that has all this armor on and he's skilled and he's heavily armed. In fact, he has some guy carrying his spear. And so in a sense, he's like a mountain to the children of Israel. And every day Goliath comes out on the hillside and he looks at the children of Israel and he says, one of you guys fight me. And then he starts cursing God and he starts cursing the children of Israel. And he, the Bible says that he did this for 40 days. Every single day he'd come out. I think it was twice a day he'd come out and he would challenge the people of Israel. And all the army, they were so intimidated by this guy. And they're looking at this guy. It's like a mountain of, of an impossible situation. They're thinking, I can't fight. He, this guy is huge. I mean, he, some people say that he was nine feet tall. Some people say he was 11 feet tall. And he's got this spear that's like, it's like a, a tree, you know, that's, that's how big it is. I mean, it's like, you know, it's huge, gigantic armor. And, uh, and so he represents this mountain. And so all the people were so intimidated by Goliath. But David shows up one day, and he's out there. He's talking to the soldiers, asking about how the, how the war is going on. And all of a sudden, David hears this Goliath. And Goliath's out there, yeah, he's mocking their God, and he's mocking them. And David gets angry and he goes, who does this guy think he is? It's almost like uh, in the time of Zechariah, who is this? What is this mountain? It's the same kind of a spirit. It's the same kind of an attitude. And David goes, he is an uncircumcised Philistine. Who does he think he is defying the armies of the living God? And so it's very interesting 
Uh, and then so David, you know, it's, it's kind of a long story, but I'll just shorten it. David decides, you know, they let him go out and fight Goliath. So you can imagine Goliath, this big warrior, this giant, this mountain of a man, and this little <laughs> this little guy comes out there, and all he's got is a slingshot. I mean, this is really a, a funny scenario. And so Goliath, of course, he just starts mocking David and mocking his God and mocking the armies of Israel. And David sort of lets him talk. And then David says this in verse in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, verse 48. David says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. He speaks right to this mountain of a man. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I, I like this. I will strike you and I will take your head off from you. I mean, he's only got a slingshot. This is going to be an interesting thing. And not, he doesn't just stop there. In this day, I'll give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. So not, not only is David uh, is challenging Goliath or threatening Goliath, you could say it like that, He's also threatening the whole army. He's going, I'm going to take, I'm going to take you all out. You're all going down. It's like, where does this guy get this? I mean, he's a guy out there with a slingshot and he goes, we're taking, I'm going to take you all out. He's, he's actually, uh, he's actually threatening the whole army. That is a, that is a funny picture if you, if you try to picture it in your mind. And so what is this uh, that, that, uh, that caused David to, to be like that. It wasn't pride because he wasn't talking about his own strength. Obviously, it was pretty pathetic. He's out there with a slingshot. But it wasn't pride, but it was confidence. It's the, what the Bible calls the spirit of faith in operation. You know, sometimes we think about, we have the theology of faith. We know the verses. We know the teachings. We know the truth of faith. But this isn't that. This isn't the theology of faith. This is the spirit of faith. This is the spirit of boldness. This is the, a boldness that comes from conf, confidence in God. And that's why David is so, I, I hate to use the word belligerent, but he's just outraged. He's enraged, outraged, whatever the word is. But he is ticked at some uncircumcised un, uh, Philistine would dare challenge the armies of the living God. It is the spirit of faith. It's the attitude of, of faith that comes from a conviction or a confidence, a boldness that's in God. And when, if you've never been affected by the spirit of faith, it sounds crazy to you that anybody would act like this. But you know, Paul said something in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He said, he said in verse 13, he said, and since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Paul said, we have, you, you see David? Paul says, you see David? You see his boldness? You see how he acted? We got that same spirit. You see uh, Zechariah? See how he acted in the presence of that mountain? We have that same spirit. You can go through all the heroes. You can go through, you go to Hebrews chapter 11. It just goes through all the heroes of faith and it shows how they acted it says that they subdued kingdoms. They enforced justice. They obtained promise. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of, the fi of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. It's, it's all these things. They had this boldness. They had this confidence. They had this assurance. And it wasn't pride. It wasn't their own soul being lifted up because of how great they were. But it was a connection that they had with God, a connection they had with the Word of God that caused them to have such confidence in God. In fact, Paul would talk about boasting. He goes, let him who, who glorieth or let him who boasts, let him boast in God. And he talked about boasting. Paul said, we have this same spirit of faith that they had. And so it may sound strange to us and foreign to us that that you know, this type of thing, but it's not foreign to scripture. You know, if you think about this, uh, you know, many of the songs that we sing are actually declarations of faith. I remember years ago, I was preaching at a nursing home and I was just talking about, you know, how to receive Christ and be saved and having a relationship with God and, and knowing that your sins are forgiven. And so afterwards, 
you know, they were putting the, the residents back in their rooms and stuff. And so I, I went around and I was just saying hi to the different ones. And, and this one old man was there and he couldn't hear real well, but he, he, I, I shook his hand. I said, God bless you. And, and he said, he, gra- he held onto my hand and he said, I want to tell you something. I had that experience that you were talking about today. And he, and he goes through this story. This, this is like 30 years ago or something. He tells me this story that when he was a young man, he was out plowing with horses. So you can imagine how lo- this is a long time ago. And he was out plowing with horses. And he said, that old devil, he said he was tormenting me. He was condemning me. He was telling me I'll, I'll never go to heaven, that, that I'm a sinner, that I can't be saved. And he was just day and night. He said, I couldn't sleep at night. And he said, I was out plowing with these horses. And one, one of the, something in the, one of the straps came undone. So he stopped and he went over there to fix the strap. And he said, I just got down on my knees and I said, God, I just, he said, tears running down his cheek. He said, God, you got to help me. That old devil is really doing me a number. And he said, all of a sudden, out of the inside of me, that old hymn came, Amazing Grace. And he said, I started to sing it, not just like a hymn like we sing in the church, but he said, I started to sing it in defiance to what was coming at my life, what was coming at me. He said, I started to sing it like it was a weapon. He started singing I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And he started just singing it out. He said, he said, it was the strangest of feelings. I said, he said, I sang it like I was defying some huge mountain, some huge Goliath that was standing in front of me. The Goliath of condemnation, the Goliath of shame, the Goliath of sin that was standing in my way. And as I just started to sing it, he said, it's just like, I don't know if he used this expression, but it's like the heavens opened up. And he said, my heart was just lifted up in that oppression, that terrible condemnation, that terrible anxiousness about, I I can't be a Christian, I can't be saved, just lifted off me. And he said, I just stood up and I just began to praise God right there, out there with the horses, you know, with the horses, the plow and every, all the birds and everything else. Yeah, I just started praising God. And he said, you know, every single time, He said that that oppression or that condemnation would try to come back on me. He said, I would just start singing that song. I'd sing it in defiance uh, of of that thing, singing right to that, right to that mountain, so to speak. You know, in a sense, what he's doing is he's using worship or he's using praise as a weapon. I've always believed that praise is a weapon. And some of the songs that we sing, if you look, listen to them, uh, you'll find out that there's songs that declare who God is. They declare God's salvation. They declare our freedom. They declare our deliverance. They declare our salvation from sin, from Satan, from bondage, from temporal difficulties, from fear, from oppression. They declare those things. And when we do that, what we're, when we sing those songs, what we're doing is we're actually speaking to a mountain. This, the mountain might be fear. The mountain might be uh, condemnation. The mountain might be despair. The mountain might be whatever it is, some kind of a natural problem. But when we start singing the song of the Lord, we start singing these songs, we are singing, we are declaring to a mountain, and that mountain has to, has to bow its knee. And so that's why it, it's very important that we see that, that, that even our songs, you know, the song we sang today, I think it was the first song that we sang. That song, um, I sing a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. That song actually came uh, to somebody. Somebody wrote that song when he heard news that one of his friend's child was in critical condition. And he got word that they didn't think the child would live through the night. They thought the child was going to die. And he, all of a sudden, fear came and despair came. And all of a sudden, he thought to himself, Oh no, we're going to lose this little boy. This, my friend's little boy is going to die. I think the little boy was just about three or four years old. And they thought, he's going to die. He's going to die. And he started to pray. And all of a sudden, this song started to rise up within him. So this mountain or this Goliath, this mountain of, of fear, this mountain of impossibility rose up in front of him. And all of a sudden, this song came. God gives us songs. The song came and he began to sing the song in defiance 
of the situation that he was facing. And so we see this incredible weapon, how we can sing the song of the Lord. Some of these old hymns of the church are so powerful. Even a lot of the newer songs are so powerful because they have, a, they have that, that note of salvation, that note of deliverance, that note that God is what he started, he's going to finish. What he began in our life, he's going to complete that work. He has not forsaken us. He has not forgotten us. That we are not abandoned, but he is with us. He's with us to deliver us and to set us free. It's so powerful that we sing these songs. You know, Jesus said the same thing. The idea is that you can't wait. You know, like sometimes we think, well, I'm going to wait until this problem goes away. Or I'm going to wait until this situation changes. And then I'm going to sing a praise song. Then I'm going to sing a song of, of the Lord. I'm going to sing a, a hymn or whatever. I'm going to sing a song. Then you can't wait until the mountain goes away. You can't wait until Goliath turns and runs. You cannot do that. You got to sing. You got to sing while the mountain is still up. You got to sing while Goliath is still standing there and yelling at you. You got to sing right in the face of adversity. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11. In verse 22 and verse 23, he said, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Some translations say, Have the faith of God, or have the God kind of faith. For surely I say to you, Whosoever says to this mountain, notice, Whosoever says to this mountain. So here again, we saw this in the Old Testament that God inspired the prophet to speak to the mountain. Who are you, mountain? You will become a plain. Now here Jesus picks up that same theme and says, whosoever, so that means it's not just for a one person or a, a prophet or for somebody who's specially anointed, but he says, whosoever, anyone, says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. And so you can say it out loud. Just say, that's how we get saved. We say Jesus is Lord. We switch lordships just by the words of our mouth. We go from darkness to light. We go from unrighteousness to righteousness by what we say, what comes out of our mouth. And so we have to, sometimes you can say this in, in song. You can speak it out in song. Sometimes you can declare it. Uh, but we, we declare, that's what David would do in the Psalms. We have 150 Psalms in the Old Testament. And a lot of them are declarations of faith. Like Psalms 23, I spoke on that a few weeks ago. How the Lord is my shepherd. He might have been feeling totally lost, totally abandoned. But he's declaring in the presence of his mountain. He's declaring the opposite. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for any good thing. He takes care of me. He leads me to the best places to eat. Of course, we can't go out to eat right now, but when, when we can go out to eat, he leads me to the best places to eat and beside the still waters. And so we declare those things. And even if there's a mountain of adversity or the opposite is happening, we declare it right in the presence of our mountain, right in the presence of our Goliath. That's what Jesus is talking about. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, I'm bringing my message to a close here in just a few minutes here. But when Jesus was on the earth, that's my cue to the worship team to get in place. <laughs> I said that and they didn't move. So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to cue them. When Jesus was on the earth, Jesus spoke to things. He spoke to the devil and the temptation in the wilderness. He spoke to sickness. He rebuked a fever. He spoke to demons. He cast demons out with his words. He spoke to storms. When storms would arise at sea, he would speak to storm. He spoke to a fig tree. That's the verse that we used here. The, the context, he had just spoken and cursed the fig tree. He spoke to a little boy's lunch. It says he blessed it and then he broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples. He spoke to that lunch. And you go through the Bible, you'll see that he spoke to cities. He spoke to Jerusalem. He spoke to uh, all kinds of things. And, and so we have to get into the habit of speaking because a lot of people don't say, well, yeah, Jesus could do that. That's Jesus. He, we're not Jesus. He's not us. We're not him. And so he could do that, but we can't do that. All we can do is just pray and hope for the best. 
But notice that Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 12, he said, most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do will he do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. When he went to the Father, he gave us the same Holy Spirit that he had upon his life, the same Holy Spirit. And so we're going to do the same works that he did, uh, but it's going to be the same way. You know, as I close this, just kind of staying with this theme about wor that worship is warfare. There's, an old ver there's a verse in the Old Testament <clears throat> in Psalms chapter 149. It talks about, let me just read a couple. I'm reading this out of the Passion Translation. It says, God's high and holy praises fill their mouths. For their, sh for their shouted praise are their weapons of war. Just think about that. Their shouted praises are their weapons of war. Their shouted praises are their weapons of war. These warring weapons will bring vengeance on every opposing force and every resistant power to bind kings with chains and rulers with iron shackles. Praise-filled warriors will enforce the judgment doom decreed against their enemies. This is the glorious honor he gives to all his godly lovers. Godly lovers. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't that powerful? He says here that our praise is not just, you know, we just... And, you know, we're just kind of doing it to be religious. It's not like that. Praise is warfare. Praise is powerful. We should, we should, in the presence of Goliath, in the presence of our mountains, we should fill our mouth and fill our heart with, with pr praises, praise songs, worship songs that are in opposition to what we're facing. You might be facing, maybe you're discouraged this morning. Maybe you're feeling like in despair, you seeing no end to in sight to the problems that you're that you're facing. Listen to me, listen. You can start praising God right where you are. Start singing songs, the songs of praise, the songs of the Lord. Start singing those songs out. And just like they did in the Bible, in defiance to the mountain, in defiance to the Goliath, begin to sing praises to God. And I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you that you're gonna see a shift in the situations. Like I said, I, just like in Zechariah there, it says that that great mountain would become a plain. A lot of the worship songs, what they do is they say that. They'll say things like that, that this difficulty will come to an end. God has not abandoned us. God has not forsaken us. And I just want you today to partake of all that God has for your life. And so we're just going to turn this over to the worship service, worship group right now, and I want them just to begin to sing one of the songs of the Lord. I want you just to enter in, and I want you to sing it like, like you're, it's defiant. You're being defiant. You're singing in the, into a mountain. You're singing into a Goliath. You're let, letting that mountain hear your voice. You're letting that Goliath hear your voice. Just sing it like you really are in defiant this morning. Walking around. 
God. God is good. Amen. So glad that you joined us today. And I just want to encourage you not to, don't, don't talk to God about your mountain. Talk to your mountains about God. That's what, we, that's a switch that every single one of us needs to make is we need to talk to our mountains, our difficulties about our great God, our God of salvation, the one who said he'd never leave us nor forsake us, that he always causes us to triumph. This is the victory that overcomes the world, overcomes everything that's going on, even our faith. I want, I want to just uh, encourage you today to release your faith through praise. Release your faith. Speak to mountains of difficulty that are in your life. 
despair, discouragement, fear. Release it through worship and praise today. I want to pray for you. Lord, I just pray right now. We just pray right now for the people that are viewing us today. God, we just pray, Lord, that you would speak encouragement. You would speak victory. You would speak peace. You would speak uh uh, safety where, where there's uncertainty, Lord. We just pray, God, that you'll be their sure foundation. You'll be their anchor in the time of storm. We just pray right now, Lord, as they begin to exercise their faith and enter into worship and praise and declare who you are and your love and your mercy over their lives. God, we just thank you for showing up big in their situation and watch those mountains move, Lord. We just thank you for it, God, right now. We bless your people in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Been great to be together. We'll see you real soon. Have an awesome day and week.